you've got Deutsche Bank with an estimated $72 trillion in derivatives exposure. Deutsche Bank is the sixth largest bank on the planet and the biggest bank in the euro block. Investors today face an unprecedented level of risks. Currency risk, major market indexes, natural deflationary forces, and endless money printing from central planners. Meanwhile, most savers today are being told to stay the course with high commission products and risky investments dependent on fraud. There is another way forward with peace of mind investing, a financial strategy with four key principles, safety, income, currency risk, and finding cash gushing value investments. Learn more about these financial strategies at fmtadvisory.com slash income. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome into CrushTheStreet.com. I'm here with a returning guest, uh, actually a favorite. His last interview we did was very well reviewed, and the audience really appreciated him <laughs> quite a bit. So I, I wanted to have him on. His name is Jim Comiskey. He's with IFG Futures Group. He's got a YouTube channel, Jim Comiskey Metals. And, you know, if, if you missed last interview, you definitely need to watch it. We talked about collapsing oil, global depression, and higher metals prices, which are all happening, by the way. So Jim is super smart, and I wanted to have him on today to expose what is arguably the biggest scam in human history, and that is the banking industry and all their speculative bets in derivatives. So first of all, Jim, thanks so yes, much for, for coming yeah, on the show. It's a pleasure to be back and across the street. Absolutely. I've been looking forward to having you back on and cool. and discussing, you know, this topic because I couldn't think of a better person to talk to about the banking industry than someone who has been immersed in the markets for mm. so many years and you you got a lot of knowledge and you know with you know Wall Street speculation number 1 Bernie Sanders talks about this it's a hot button topic and probably one of the only uh -huh. things that he says that I actually agree with the Bank of International Settlements estimates around one quadrillion in global derivatives out there. So, you know, I'd like to get your thoughts and maybe you can lay the groundwork here for, you know, the big banks and their involvement with derivatives. Totally cool. Again, Kenneth, uh, thanks for having me back. It, it truly is a pleasure and an honor um, to be back talking to your, your bed members, your viewership your listenership um but dude, dude did you just call me like really smart <laughs> you're a smart guy no you're you're a smart guy you gotta you, <laughs> okay. all, all people need to do is listen to you and they will know that you're a okay. smart guy all right well yeah i've been doing this a long time as you know and perhaps you've got some new people um that haven't listened to me before we had a, we yeah we had almost fourteen thousand hits views mm -hmm. um, the last time me and you spoke. Again, Kenneth, it's an honor. Um, but in terms of the big banks, okay, see, uh, let's just cut straight to the chase, okay? And I'm going off the top of my head here, okay? Um, uh, my notes are actually elsewhere. It's been a busy day. Okay, you've got Deutsche Bank with an estimated $72 trillion in derivatives exposure. And uh, Deutsche Bank is the sixth largest bank on the planet and the biggest bank in the euro block. And, uh, the, okay, so let's put that into context. They've got $72 trillion in exposure vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, risk assets, if you will. And uh, the GDP of Germany, the, the official gross domestic product of Germany last year was like $3.9 trillion. Now, Deutsche Bank and $72 trillion in derivatives exposure? Um, let's talk about negative interest rates. And, Kenneth, I want you to seriously 
jump in when you want to jump in. Mm-hmm. Because so, me and you are starting to get a good get a good <laughs> rapport here. Jim, it's, it's good. So, so what are what are the banks doing? They 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 invest in these derivatives and they're they're doing it for profit, right? And so, what are what are they investing Absolutely. in? How how are they able to do this? You know, what are they investing in? Okay. Um, now that's an excellent question. Um, and what I'm going to address here, uh, you know, initially anyway, is the um, yen carry trade. Okay. Uh, what what a lot of banks are doing is they're borrowing in yen at negative interest rates, and they're deploying the the, the proceeds um, into U.S. stocks. Now, uh, okay, now uh, by negative interest rate, it's it's a bit frightening because um, the bottom line here is um, a normal yield curve, and hey. If you want to, if you want to interrupt me, do so, please, James. A normal yield curve is up sloping, which means, uh, you know, the street is looking for that sovereign to have economic growth. Okay, um, because they're going to demand a, a higher yield going out thirty years. Uh, typically, uh, the longest duration on a yield curve from a sovereign is going to be a thirty-year bond. Mm. Okay. And uh, but what's happening here, and what happened uh, yesterday, which was highly, highly unusual, was the ten-year note and the thirty-year bond in the United States. And I'll get to I'll get to the bank's exposure, but if you allow me, Kenneth, um, there's some background that I need to address here. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. You cool with that? Yep. Okay. Um, right. Okay. So. The, 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 let's start out in Asia, okay? The Japanese 30-year bond, the equivalent to our 30-year bond in terms of duration, yielded a record low on uh, yesterday, Monday actually, of 0.492%. Hmm. Uh, so uh, you're... Basically, you're paying to borrow from the the Japanese government just for what safety of your principal. It's no longer about return; it's about return of principal, as much principal as you can grab, um, because investments don't yield anything anymore. And this is a great changing experiment. Okay, so you've got. Uh, a Citibank yesterday announced that they were uh, going to cut. Well, they're twenty. They're going to net twenty-five percent less than they did last year, year on year. And uh, uh, basically, it, it's a situation where um, uh, rates are going to go negative in the United States. Yeah, in my opinion, Kenneth. In my humble opinion, it's inevitable. So they're uh, doing. Are going to go negative. So can they have and have their derivative exposure and continue to invest the way they do and speculate the way people are calling it with rising interest rates in a rising interest rate environment? Yes, and and, and there's a there's a very simple answer, to this. and you know, and uh, I know your listeners are quite educated because of the comments that I've gotten. Uh, from our our last rant, if you will, um, when Glass Steagall <clears throat> was repealed in 1997, and it had everything to do with Alan Greenspan and Hank Paulson. Hank Paulson, him formerly of the Vampire Squid, Goldman Sachs, who was Treasury Secretary at the time. Okay. And they repealed Glass Steagall. Now, Glass Steagall is uh, an act uh, that was written into law in 1934. I might be off by a year or two there, but I think it was 1934, which did not allow banks to use depositors' funds to speculate in the markets. Mm-hmm. Well, now this 
Act was repealed in, in 1998, in other words, all of a sudden, Kenneth, me and you, our money that's in the bank somewhere, uh, currently can be used, uh, marginalized, it can be used like nine to one in terms of, say, you got a hundred bucks, they, they can pay that at $900. Um, okay, so I, 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 I want to stop right there. So that's that's very important. Please. Our money is, be, is, is being leveraged nine to one uh, by exactly. the banks. So, you know, what, what could happen to disrupt their speculative investments? And how does this, you know, how does this trickle down into the economy? Why are people concerned about banking speculation? I'll, I'll, I'll let you answer it that way. Totally cool. <laughs> Again, a salient point and a great question, Kenneth. Um, basically, they're overextended. The, the, the basically, we've got like five majors now. We've got really five big banks in the United States. Okay, nothing has changed since 2008. Nothing was fixed. No one went to jail. So we got J.P. Morgan. Mm -hmm. We've got Goldman Sachs, we've got Morgan Stanley, we've got Wells Fargo, and, uh, you know, we basically have uh, the, the cabal in Midtown Manhattan who is using our money, over-leveraging it, and if rates start to turn north, which they're probably not going to, um, going to rather, Anytime soon, because I don't think, I think the Fed's made a mistake and they're going to be on hold for a while. I still think that crude oil is going down to $20, $18 because demand just isn't there. If you look at, say, at the Baltic Dry Index, you look at some leading indicators, the Baltic Dry being a shipping index, uh, Panamax, Capex, Supermax, um, it, it's a measure of global trade if you will. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, and I actually have a friend and a customer who worked in the oil industry, and he says one of the biggest storage facilities for U.S. crude oil is in the pipeline system itself, not on ships sitting offshore, which costs money. Mm -hmm. if, if they reduce the volume flow uh, to like zero, they're just storing all the crude oil that's being produced in the pipeline system, ready to offload once demand picks up. Now, I'm going to address your question about banks because it's it's highly relevant, and it's not just like um, you know your big five in the states that are over leveraged um, with say the Balkan shale um, companies, the fracking companies. Um, it's also European banks. Most notably, Deutsche, okay, mm -hmm. um, Royal Bank of Scotland. You've got UBS, United Bank of Switzerland. You've got Mitsubishi out in Asia. They have huge exposure to the shale drillers, the, the frackers, in, say, North Dakota south of there, in the States. And they're due, they, those frackers, are due to roll an estimated, wait for this now, I've seen this from three sources, $4 trillion worth of debt they got to roll. But it's all predicated on crude oil being at like $70, $65 a barrel. Mm -hmm. Well, as we all know, crude is at like 37 a barrel. So wow. when they roll these loans over, yeah. And the thing is, uh, the uh, Richard Fisher, President of the Dallas Fed actually had made a statement uh, urging the lenders that are over leveraged to the to the shale uh, you know, producers in the states to not mar to market their actual debt once they have to roll over, and that's just not only highly unusual. Um, that is basically uh, doing like kind of like like an Enron where we're offloading, this isn't on our balance sheet anymore because the Dallas Fed requested that we do not put this on our balance sheet anymore, mark the market. Yeah. In other words, huge losses, recognized 
huge losses um, because it would be too precarious in terms of you know market movement. But it, you know, it, it, the chatter is getting louder and louder. And Jim, you, you know, you really pointed out there and articulated how we are, are more addicted than ever to growth in the markets. And with all this oh, yeah. margin and leverage and, you know, low interest rates and any oh, yeah. any slowdown in the global economy, which we are seeing, uh, is this what could be that? bubble burst and what 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 kind of collapse in the derivatives market could we potentially <laughs> could we see here i guess kenneth you're getting really good at this dude you really are <laughs> and I, i'm not denigrating you by saying that you, yeah. you're you're getting really sharp here <laughs> i'm gonna excuse me i'm gonna harken back to uh an episode that occurred and I believe it was 1983, 1984. I'm a big, big, big um, student of history. Because if you don't learn from history, which we never do, because there's not enough people that study history, you're going to repeat history. Uh, it was a firm. It was a little boutique shop called Double Bressler. Okay? And it reneged on some overnight repurchase agreements with your J.P. Morgans, and Solomon Brothers at the time, who was big, uh, and your Merrill Lynch's, who were the biggest, well, almost. Uh, and all of a sudden, they were made on just like a hundred million, not well, just, but this was in like mid eighties, hundred million dollars worth of overnight repurchase agreements. And this whole thing snowballed to the point where the governor of Oklahoma the state of Oklahoma in the United States had to declare a one-week banking holiday. In other words, no one could take any money out of their bank mm. account because this little boutique shop, I believe it was located in southern Florida, um, reneged on $100 million in repos, and it snowballed. Now, imagine this. Okay, Imagine Deutsche wow. blowing up. Um, imagine this. And the, so the counterparty risk, Kenneth, to your JPs, your Goldman's, your Royal Bank of Scotland, your UBS, your your Warburgs, your Mitsubishi's, your, uh, all of a sudden the counterparty risk is going to spread and manifest itself in a similar fashion that the MS Global debacle in uh, on 11, 11, 11, um, you know, it basically trashed the markets. I think, okay, go ahead, I, I sent you that, you want to ask a question, go ahead. <laughs> you know what, I, I was going to, no, I, I was going to just ask you what, what does this mean for the average working man? Does this mean that his uh, his his home uh, price is going uh, to go down? His stock market, um, you know, port, what he has in his four hundred one k is at risk. Um, you know, what? How 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 does it apply to the average person? Here it is. Okay. Now I assume that everybody, your all your listeners, were able to hear what you just asked, so I'm going to repeat it. Right? Yeah, everyone heard that. Okay. Awesome. Okay. How this applies to your average man. Okay. Remember in 2008 when, uh, you know, we looked aghast at our, our, our 401ks and our perhaps uh, speculative account, you know, trading stocks or, you know, maybe an IRA or maybe whatever. Uh, and we got absolutely smoked. The mm -hmm. market got smoked. Yep. Okay. Uh, the way, Kenneth, in my humble opinion, the way to protect yourself, particularly in this environment, is by being long gold, being long silver, being long real estate, uh, and yes, this is going to sound perverse, but also being long the U.S. dollar. Now, in, in this environment, uh, you know, silver is, gold is barely $200 since, like, late December which is a significant move. Uh, silver has lagged. I, and, uh, you know, it's my opinion that 
The reason silver is lagged is because silver is used industrially. About 40% of the above ground silver is used in like cell phones and solar panels and things of that nature, and they end up in, you know, scrap heaps and junkyards. So it's indicative of the market, like the Baltic drop, okay, anticipating a huge economic slowdown because the industrial use of silver is no longer going to be as, you know, as huge as it was because no one wants to buy solar panels anymore. Cell phones are slowing down. I, Apple reported, by the way, late last week, uh, the first time ever that iPhone sales have dropped off year on year. Um, so it, the, the, the average guy, hmm, I'm sitting there. Uh, I, you, what do I know, right? Mm. I'm no genius. But the, as, as Aristotle said, you know, uh, like 3,400 years ago, a wise man admits he knows nothing. Mm. I've been doing this 34 years, and I learn new things every day. And the only way, because the central banks the world over in conjunction, Kenneth, with the majors, the biggest banks in the world, have basically colluded uh, to go with negative interest rates in an effort to stimulate consumer spending. No one wants to spend when the bulk of jobs that are reported, say, in the United States, are bartenders and waitress jobs. Those people, and I'm not denigrating any bartender or waitress. I love you guys. <laughs> right? Well, but of course. Can you afford a $350,000 house and, and two cars and two washing machines or a dishwasher, whatever, um, a microwave, an oven, uh, on a bartender or waitress salary? No. What I'm alluding to is durable goods. You People, we are at an all-time high in terms of rental. Um, in the United States, vis-a-vis home ownership, and this is all part and parcel of what occurred in '08, and nothing's been fixed, nothing's been cured, and the little guy just continues to get his nuts squeezed. And you know, according to uh, you know the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics and uh, the Commerce Department, well, consumer price index is like zero. There's no inflation, <laughs> really. Have they, have they paid a college tuition bill lately? Jim, you know, I, on that note right there, I don't know if you saw the headlines yes, this sir, morning, but um, mm-hmm. we're this is the seventh. We're doing this interview on what is the seven year anniversary of when the bull market started on March 9th, thousand nine, and you noticed you, that, did you? I, I did. I did <laughs> notice that. Yeah, it was kind of. I was interested. <laughs> And I, I guess right. they're they're not they're not calling it a bear market yet because we haven't corrected tw- well, by right. twenty twenty percent yet. So things are, are right. still good. Uh, now to give the the article some credit, they were calling it the most hated bull market on history because I think people have very vivid memories of what happened in 2008 and they know they know things are on shaky ground here ground here hearing the global news oil collapsing right you know the 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 people that they know unemployed the cost of living you know i i I tend to think that janet yellen is going to do what she can because she is a democrat to, to keep the stock market together at least until the election because I think it would hurt uh, the Democrats' <laughs> chances to be able to oh, win. Go ahead. No, finish it up. Finish it up. No, I, I was just saying, I, I think, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not a, a hardcore Republican or anything. I, I lean libertarian. Right, right. But I, I, know, tend, I tend to think... I, th- I tend to think that uh, Janet Yellen is going to try to keep this thing together and give Hillary a chance here, because if the stock market collapses on a Democrat watch, it might give the Republicans a little more momentum. So your thoughts? No, I like that. I like that. Okay. Um, you know what? Um, it, there's really two things we shouldn't talk about right now, uh, dude. I, I'm old school, but that would be 
politics and religion. All right, so let's just... <laughs> the Fed is supposed to be apolitical, and you know and I know they're not, okay? <laughs> um, that's, that's neither here nor there. But uh, let's just uh, harken back to one of the first things that Helicopter Ben Bernanke did in 06 when he took over the Fed, all right? The first thing was all deposits that, you know, there's currently 21 money center banks you know, is that, uh, that can borrow from the Fed at the discount window, okay? Uh, they're called primary dealers. And when they borrow at the discount window, it used to be a stigma. It meant that the bank had issues. But now they're borrowing at 0% in essence, uh, 0.25%, and they're relending it to the Fed. They're keeping it on the Fed's book, and they're giving it an automatic 25 basis point of joy in that trade. Mm. So the money, the, the, the Fed's balance sheet, if you can do this, please, uh, put, if you guys can do this, um, put the Fed balance sheet and, and the S&P 500 uh, on the same chart since 08, and they match tick for tick for tick for tick. Mm. Because primary dealers are buying money at zero. They're throwing it into stocks, and they're just walking away guaranteed, knowing that they have winning trades. Now, the yen carry trade works part and parcel with the same trade, because mm -hmm. they're borrowing at like almost 0%. And the Fed wants people and banks and sovereigns to take, uh, and all central banks, uh, to take extra risk in order to try and stimulate the economy and get people spending again. But you know what? If the jobs aren't there, people are not going to be spending money like they used to. Sure. And therefore, all the banks that are on the hook for all these really high yield, uh, basically junk bond type loans, most notably to the, the oil majors. Uh, by the way, Exxon Mobil announced a couple days ago they're cutting their, their CAPEX, their capital expenditures to this year 25%. That's wow. definitely like a like a three percent decline in U.S. GDP right there. Wow. They used to be the biggest company by market cap, you know, until the tech companies took over. And how's that trade working out for you? Wow, you know? that one that one company cutting capex by twenty five percent will lower yeah, will lower huge. U.S. GDP by 3%. Huge. And that, you know, yeah. like you were saying earlier, you know, a $150 million issue back in the 1980s spurred yeah. a major crisis, you know, a bank holiday. <laughs> and, you know, this, there's just You're a lot, there's, well, there's a lot well. of things that are, <laughs> that are bubbling right now in the economy. So, wow. Exactly. So, so Jim, you know, gold hitting 52 week highs here. Uh, precious metals yeah. are, are on the rise. You know, get, let's get your, you know, kind of closing thoughts here uh, with precious metals. Totally cool. Totally cool. All right. Um, if you're if you're still stacking, okay. What I would recommend at this stage, and I've always recommended this kind of, you know, put don't put more than ten to twenty percent of your investable net worth into precious metals, but it's a way to protect the dollars that you've earned over your career. Okay, so you need to have that physical in my humble opinion. Now, at this stage of the game, gold has run so far so fast. I think silver is a better value at like $15, or, you know, $14, $15, $15. Uh, I, you, you, we go back to Sir Isaac Newton, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and his original silver-gold ratio was 15.5 to 1. Right now, the silver-gold ratio is over 300 to 1. Wow. The definition being... How many ounces of silver in local currency, in dollar value, does it take you to buy one ounce of gold? Okay, it used to be 15 and a half ounces of silver to one. And now it's like 300 ounces of silver to one ounce of gold. So I think a, a nice long-term type of play would be to start stacking silver physical either directly through the U.S. Treasury or you can go through CAD, you can go through Bank of Canada, or you, you know, and, and start stacking up on maple beliefs or, um, and, or you go out to coin shows and look for Morgan 
you know, silver dollars going back to the 1880s, early 1900s that are in good shape, it's an ounce of physical. It has meltdown value, but it also has numismatic value. All right, so I think silver's the way to go. If you don't already own land or if you're not in a position to own land, buy physical silver. Jim, I, I really do okay. appreciate. You know what? It, 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 it's it's good <laughs> advice. Um, you know, I there obviously yeah. we could talk a lot about you know how to structure our oh, finances. Course. I mean, you know, being debt yeah. being debt free, you know, and not so mm-hmm. exposed to the way uh, the economy is. You know, being dependent on the economy is what's going to be a problem for people. And, exactly. and the, the more you can separate yourself from you know the dependency of a growing economy I think the better off you're going to be and I think I think you can hit the nail yeah. on the head with um, your, your your advice there so if people want right. to reach reach out to you Jim and learn more about what you do uh, where would they go and what would they find uh, okay yes sir um, I, I do a YouTube rant uh, generally about three or four times a week and it's just Jim Comiskey Metals dot com that's c-o-m-i-s-k-e-y metals dot com um and i give you my my geopolitical views on uh, why i think that the pms the precious metals are going to soar and and they're going to soar uh you know in relative terms okay um and i don't want this to really happen because if it does happen like i'm envisioning that means the world economy is going to hell in the handbasket well, personally, I feel as though the world economy is going to hell in a handbag. <laughs> and yeah. so, and let's do this now. Um, you have all my contact information there, Kenny. I'm yeah. looking for a business card, and I'm currently, I apologize for this, but I'm in the hospital waiting room, waiting on my ma. She had issues with her hip. Oh, gosh. <laughs> wow. Well, no, 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 no. We're good. We're good. We're good. Uh, but I don't have a business card on me. So, people, please, um, refer to my 1-800 number if you're in, in the States. It's free. Uh, I'm sure Kenneth will post it. Um, if you're outside or if you're uh, in, outside the States, rather, call me on a 312 number. And my uh, personal email address at IFG is just jim.comiskey at ifgfutures.com. And shoot me an email. I love comments. I love questions. I endeavor to answer all comments and questions. Uh, people, Muppets, <laughs> Army of Comiskey, we are all in this together. I'm this guy that's been behind that curtain for 34 years, and I know what, what the big boys are doing uh, because I have a lot of friends and customers that are big boys. And uh, so... Uh, Please give me a call, and um, you know we'll we'll try and hedge up your physical if you currently have a big stack, or we'll try and speculate. Um, no guarantees, but it's as simple as that. Jim Comiskey, I'd love to hear from your audience. Uh, absolutely Hello. everyone that's yeah. Jim Comiskey you know he's got a lot of knowledge uh, a lot of understanding of the market a great history of working in the markets yeah. and uh, Jim wow I didn't realize uh, you you were in a hospital uh, waiting room uh, yeah, I do I no, hope I do cool. hope everything is okay I mean, you just, yeah, but dude, uh, yeah it'll be okay she's okay but uh, we've had this uh, you know this interview scheduled for like two weeks and I didn't want to back out so that's why I had to push it back, push it back, push it back. Remember we were originally going to do it at like 9 this morning, 10 this morning, whatever. And we did it at 12.30. So it, it works. Absolutely. Um, you know, I like do, I said, I do appreciate it. And, you know, I, yeah, I do, I do wish, w- wish, 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 wish every, you know, wish your mom the best and uh, the situation. Thanks, so I appreciate that. I appreciate that. But, again, what I want to reiterate is uh, we're all in this together. Okay, there's a certain element in the markets that, that doesn't care a whit about me or you, Kenneth, or anybody listening to me currently. I'm uh, on the other side of that coin because the better my customers do and my friends do and people I talk to do in the markets, the better I do. 
Uh, but I'm into long-term business relationships. I'm not into, like, you know, Goldman Sachs, sell me your gold because it's going to 900 as they buy gold as it goes up to 1300 Really? How's that working for you? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Understood, sir. Right. Understood. <laughs> Kenneth, as always, dude, it, it's been a ball. It's been a ride. It's been fun. I look forward to talking to your peeps. And uh, you know what? Again, we are all in this together. And that's basically the bottom line, and that's a great way to end this interview, I guess. Thanks so Thanks. much, sir.